Welcome, and thank you for joining us for a conversation on young elected leaders bridging the partisan divide, part of the Eagleton Institute of Politics Gambaccini Civic Engagement Series. My name is Elizabeth Maddow. I'm a research professor here at the Eagleton Institute and direct our Center for Youth Political Participation. The Louis J. Gambaccini Civic Engagement Series was designed to promote civic engagement through an annual discussion of timely and important issues of great significance with the objective of generating civil discourse and action. The program was established through the generous support of Lou Gambaccini's family, his friends, his colleagues to honor his outstanding legacy of public service and his lifelong dedication in upholding the highest standards of civic responsibility. We thank all of them for their support. We're really pleased to be hosting this discussion today in which we're gonna be asking, can millennials and Gen Z heal our nation? What efforts can they take to bridge the partisan divide and relieve hyper-partisanship? The Center for Youth Political Participation is focused on encouraging and supporting political learning and engagement among young adults. We do that in a number of ways. We do it through civic education. We do it by encouraging our students to register and vote, but we also do it by studying young adults who are running for office and serving in office and by trying to build their capacity as candidates and as leaders. Our center's Young Elected Leaders Project was launched in 2004 and the young elected leaders at the time were members of Generation X. So today we're looking at the millennial generation and Generation Z who are running for office and holding office. And it's an important subject for many reasons. Um, these are large generations. They are the most diverse generations in American history, well-educated generations, um, but facing really unique challenges. So not only might young adults today, millennials and Gen Z bring a unique outlook to governing, um, they deserve representation. So I'm really happy to be exploring this conversation today, not only with two young adults who are serving in office, but also with Layla Zayden, the president and CEO of the Millennial Action Project. The Millennial Action Project is the largest nonpartisan organization of young lawmakers in the United States. And MAP works with over 1,600 um, millennials, Gen Z, who are holding office in Congress or in state legislatures around the country. And the goal is really to bridge divides, to collaborate on future-oriented policy, and really scale a healthy democracy. Layla joined MAP in 2016 and previously served as their executive director, their chief operating instructor, I'm sorry, Chief Operating Officer. Um, and she's nationally recognized on the subject of youth civic participation and youth engagement and has been featured in numerous outlets, including Teen Vogue, Forbes, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. Um, so welcome, Layla. Uh, really happy to have you joining me in this conversation. Um, I wanna start by just asking you a couple questions and then I'm gonna ask you if you could invite um, and introduce our state legislators. Um, but I gave you gave our folks a little bit of background on MAP, but why don't I hand off to you, Layla, to give us, tell us a little bit more about the Millennial Action Project, the work that you do and your impact. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth, for, for convening this conversation and to Rutgers for, for hosting us. Um, I'm very excited to be doing this today because it is actually my six year anniversary of being with MAP. So um, I can think of no better way to celebrate than to talk about the incredible young leaders um, in our network, which as you mentioned, we've got 1600 young elected leaders in Congress, uh, the lion's share really at the state level. And the mission of our organization is to train and to empower those young elected officials to build a more functional democracy. So a lot of that happens through bridge building, uh, through coalition building, ultimately through getting things done, right? Passing future-oriented bipartisan legislation. Um, 
the vehicle by which we do that is uh, a f- something called a future caucus, which is like a little mini map chapter in the legislature. So we've got a congressional future caucus. We have 31 future caucuses across the country. Um, Rep Pilkington and Senator Lamar uh, have been instrumental in, in leading those uh, at the state level. And we'll get to talk to them a little bit about that in just a few minutes. Um, but really the theory of change is if you can create an environment for even just for a few moments, people to shed their partisan identity and unite first and foremost along that generational identity, um, you can begin to unlock solutions that you never would have seen or considered otherwise. And so more so than even just actually getting things done, which is a very important part of, of being a legislator, creating a permission structure for people to engage across difference, to consider lots of different opinions and and backgrounds as you make decisions. That has been the power of the future caucus and and of this network. Um, You know, I I also think that just when it comes to serving as role models for other legislators, for voters, uh, even for the media, these young leaders who are part of MAP are, are making this idea real, right? It's giving folks a real tangible example and proof that um, you can engage across difference with with empathy and still be effective. Um, And so our work really centers on creating those opportunities. We do events that help connect legislators across state lines. We have capacity building programs, uh, of course, lots of media and storytelling so people know about the fantastic work that's that's happening, uh, being led by these young leaders. And we're just, we're so excited to do whatever they need in order to be successful because they're the folks who are doing the hard work. That's great. Um, On that subject of media and storytelling, um, you know, as we're a few weeks out now from the midterms and certainly a lot of discussion and I've been a part of it and you have too on uh, did young adults turn out and what were voter turnout rates like. Um, But certainly I'm interested in and I'm certainly interested to hear what your thoughts are on um, what resonated with you um, in this most recent midterm when it comes to young adults who were running for office um, and winning. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been so much focus uh, and rightfully so on young people turning out and voting in near record numbers. And that's that's really important. And I'm so glad that we're talking about it. Um, I think less has been sort of written or discussed about how many young people ran for office uh, this cycle and how many actually won. We did a, a report. We released a report recently called Millennials on the Rise. And in it, we saw that there was a 57 percent increase in millennials and Gen Z running for Congress. Um, and so what you know, one of the takeaways from that for me is that there might be frustration and uh, dissatisfaction with the status quo, with with politics as they are, but young people aren't shutting down. They're not running away from civics. They're actually running towards it. Um, And that's a really powerful thing that that we should harness in in this moment. Um, I think a lot of that is actually thanks to, to lawmakers, again, sort of blazing that trail, making it seem possible, making young people to imagine themselves in these roles. It doesn't feel so inaccessible when you can actually see other young people doing that that work. And so sort of this most recent midterm election, seeing that growth in young people um, running is is, uh, sort of a really important data point I think we should keep our eye on. The second takeaway uh, that I had was just the winners of those elections were actually pretty much evenly split between Democrats and Republicans. So there's this myth out there um, of young people as a monolith. And we we tend to talk about young people as um, like exclusively Democrats. And uh, in fact, the fastest growing political affiliation is independent or not affiliated. And so what that tells me is the quality of the candidate, the quality of the leader, what you're able to get done when you're in office really matters because the letter that comes behind your name, the D or the R, is not going to be enough to turn people out, you actually have to deliver results for them. You have to listen to them. And I think uh, people winning uh, who have who have really demonstrated that is a real testament to the fact that um, focusing on the issues is really the 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 winning uh, playbook moving forward. Um, and so there's you know tons more to to dissect. So sort of coming off this this election, and excited to get into a little bit of it today. 
Me too. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, so regarding our format, I'm going to hand off to Layla and she's going to introduce um, our two young elected leaders who are joining us. She'll have a few questions for them. I'll have a few questions for them. But we're going to certainly save time at the end um, to have our guests uh, answer questions from our audience. So you'll see there's a Q&A button. So we encourage you to, you have a question for our guests, um, to please submit your question and we'll get to it at the end. Um, on that note, I'm going to hand off to Layla to, to introduce um, our guests. Okay. Well, wonderful. So I have the distinct honor of introducing two absolutely phenomenal folks. Um, first, ladies first, right, Senator London Lamar, who uh, is from Tennessee, is part of our Tennessee Future Caucus. Um, she's currently the state senator for District 33. And after being appointed by the Shelby County Board of Commissioners, she became the youngest African-American female legislator uh, uh, in Tennessee State Senate. And so actually, let me say that differently, because she was both the youngest female um, and Af African American legislator. So uh, just really incredible uh, milestone there. She's proud to serve as the chair of the Shelby County delegation of state legislators, where she ushered over $40 million in resources back to Shelby County. Over her four years serving in the House of Representatives, she introduced over 45 pieces of legislation, passed several bills into law. During that time, she passed bills that eliminate human trafficking, increase family health care and resources, reduce gun violence, expand voting rights and access, and increase job opportunities for Memphians. Um, all, you know, and, and Tennesseans. So um, London, Senator Lamar, so grateful to have you here. Um, briefly, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Rep. Aaron Pilkington before I kick the, the first question over to you, Senator Lamar. Um, but Rep. Pilkington, who may have, have dropped off for a second here, but he uh, is the co-chair of our Arkansas Future Caucus. He is uh, also a regional vice president of operations for Arkansas Care and is currently serving his second term in the Arkansas House of Representatives. He represents District 69, which includes portions of Johnson and Pope counties. As the only state legislator with a degree in healthcare administration and one of the youngest members of the legislature, he brings a very unique perspective uh, and a fresh look at political issues. He's currently on uh, the, he's on three committees, the Joint Committee on Energy, House Revenue and Taxation Committee, and House Insurance and Commerce Committee. Uh, first elected in 2016, he actually defeated the incumbent legislator at the time. Um, and he is uh, widely considered as a pretty conservative member of the House, but says that he is no firebrand. So we'll ask him about that as well. Um, but welcome, welcome to you both. And um, thank you for being here. So, <laughs> so Senator Lamar, I'm going to come to you first, because, um, you know, we just read your bio. You're such an impressive person. You know, people are going to get to meet you. You're just a, a charismatic young person who could do literally anything that you wanted to do. Why did you run for office? That's actually a great question. I've always kind of, I like the idea of politics. When I was growing up, uh, my grandmother and her friends had a social club. They were playing different community events and trips and things. So I was a nosy little kid standing around a table, listening to grown folks conversations, and they would talk about politics a lot. And then my mom, she was very quiet, but she liked to volunteer and learn new things. So every day after school, when I was on my homework, Oprah would come on at five, four o'clock and the news would come on at five. And like every day while I'm doing my homework, my mom, I was listening to the things that Oprah was saying on her talk show, which were very socially conscious issues. And so the idea of service and then the idea of being socially conscious come together, created me. So when I was going through high school and middle school and college, I was always student council, class president, doing something where I felt like I could make an impact on my community. And so after I graduated, from St. Mary's College, I came back home and saw there was deflection of young people representation in the city of Memphis. And I was wondering why none of my friends wanted to come back home. And it's because how we were leading our city was so outdated because with no disrespect to everybody else, our elected officials are all 
habitual runners come from name recognitions, big families, and they were all older. They had no creative ideas and they were pretty complacent and lazy. And so what I wanted to bring was something different to the political landscape in my city. So I started the Shelby County Young Democrats in my city, grew that up to be the largest chapter, became the president of the Tennessee Young Democrats. So I traveled the state and the country advocating for young people under the age of 35 to get directly involved in the democratic politics. And of course, run for office. And when I was president, over half my board ran for office and many of them run. So beyond, you know, having a love for politics, I put myself in a position to grow my leadership skills and prove that I can be a trusted asset to the community, that if that was given a chance to run for office, that I, they could trust me to do the work. And when I ran for state representative in 2018, I won and became the youngest member of the General Assembly. Now I'm a state senator and now I'm the youngest woman and the youngest African-American. Well, I'm still the youngest woman in the General Assembly, wow. but being the youngest woman and African-American to ever serve in Tennessee Senate history at the age of 31 you have to be 30 to be a senator i just think that it's a testament to young people is that don't let what the grown folks say or what you think that you hear about young people influence the, the way in your capacity to get involved if you can prove that you can do the work if you can get in a position to grow your leadership skills if you can get behind specific issues that directly impact community members run and work hard you know i will tell young people it's so funny Guess what? When I ran for office the first time in 2018, I got fired from my job one month later because my boss then would not want me working for her and running for office at the same time. Little did she know was I had a 401k with about $6,000 in it. I emptied out my little retirement, paid on my rent, and I became my own campaign manager. And what young people do was we were creative. I taught myself Photoshop. So I designed all my literature, my signs, my website everything. I had time to fundraise and I was able to canvas every day, all day and get those votes out. So sometimes when you decide to put your out, yourself out there for any dream that is going to take you to the next level, that will be hurdles. That will be anticipated setbacks. But if you push through, if you can get through the uncomfortable uh, uh, part of running for your dreams or running for office, then I promise you, you will be also saying that you the youngest this and you the youngest that. And I think it's important that our generation finally gets in office because one, we the largest base of, uh, of eligible voters and economic voters in this country. And if we are not doing what we're supposed to do and engage in a political process, then we can't grow our city, states, and our country in a way that is encompassing of what our real reality looks like now. Yeah. I love that. Just sensing that fire from within and seeing other people not delivering for you and thinking I could do that and, and going for it. I think that's a really powerful and, and powerful story. Uh, Rep Pilkington, so same question to you. What made you run that first time for, for office? First off, I'm sorry if I've been distracting. My laptop went down, phone went down, and it's, it's been, an, I've had IT issues at the Wazoo over here. So sorry for being distracting. Um, but yeah, you know, I think um, initially what made me want to run was just uh, being around it, you know, um, much, much like um, our, my senator colleague uh, has stated. But you know, really a big part was just seeing that you could have a change in your own local community. You know, my mom ran for school board uh, back when I was really small. And, you know, she did it just because she wanted to be involved. She, she knew there were issues with the school system and she really just didn't want her kids to have to deal with with those problems that she was seeing. And so she, you know, saw a problem, took it on, took it on herself to, to do something about it. My, my parents were always kind of that way. You know, they started a soccer program down there. There wasn't any soccer down in little rural Arkansas, Mina, which uh, if you're seeing that movie, Tom Cruise made America that happens in Mina. So it's the only, <laughs> only claim to fame is drug running, but um, oh boy. so it was one of those things um, I just saw through my parents that you can have an effect on your community um, if you just want to do the work. And so then when I was um, around high school, there was a school bond issue that came up. Um, I got asked to kind of lead uh, a group of students to support it. And even though we failed, um, you know, it was just something that, like, even though I couldn't vote, I could still be involved. Um, and so that's, uh, that was a really big message or a big, big thing for me to understand was, sorry, I got to get the camera right. Uh, was just to understand that you can really have a big effect regardless of how old you were. And so just from there, I kind of got the bug and, and started working on campaigns and, and uh, worked through in college and, and I'll say legislative races, things like that. It was actually funny is when I'd go to recruit people, I would always say, 
well, you know, I would run for this seat if I could, but I can't because I live so and so or this and that. And uh, and I always would use that line like, well, I would do it if I could, but I need you to run for it. And then literally uh, I had the conversation when I was in the seat I'm currently in is someone said, well, you can run for this seat. So why don't you run for it? <laughs> and so I just thought, well, you know, um, I'm a man of my word. And so I, I signed up and ran for it and, and won and, and I beat a, beat a, actually a couple that had been trading the seat back and forth for over 12 years in the area were kind of a, a, a dynastic uh, family. And, you know, I think their cousin was the, the mayor of one of the larger cities in the district. And so I uh, kind of took on the machine and won. And um, so, you know, but it's, uh, that's kind of how I got started and, 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 you know, what, what led me to my first run for office. Wow. And so let's talk a, a little bit about that. For both of you, you alluded to what it was like to campaign as a young person, as a first time candidate, even having maybe been exposed to campaigns before, but doing it yourself and being a young person, what was that like? And and I think sort of um, in in particular, I'm curious in this most recent election, what is that transition like between campaigning and having to really fire up voters to turn out to then governing where you've got to work with people of the opposite party to get things done. You've got to be a consensus builder. Is there is there a difference in how you campaign and how you govern? And sort of what was that experience like for you? And, and Senator Lamar, let's start with, with you again, um, because you spoke a little bit about sort of the training yourself on, on Photoshop and really bootstrapping uh, from the beginning to, to the success you are now as a sitting state senator. Absolutely. So uh, I will definitely say... Um, I won't say one is harder than the other. The strategy is very different. So when it comes to campaigning, unfortunately, voters tend to want to hear more polarizing topics of the more extreme issues that parties are champion. Like I have the most Democratic Senate district in the state of Tennessee. I beat my Republican opponent by 80 percent. And, you know, for me, they want to hear many of the things that um, Democrats are talking about um, that uh, are impacting them. But I also have the blackest Senate district in the state of Tennessee, which means I have the largest concentration of African-Americans in the state. So when it comes to campaigning, my voters want to hear what I'm going to do for the black community. They want to hear about their issues only, how I'm going to help uh, alleviate poverty, how I'm going to help our schools, how I'm going to stop Crime because unfortunately in Tennessee, the black community is steady getting hindered from being able to achieve equal opportunities based on a lot of the policies that our state implements. And so they oftentimes want to hear of a black agenda only. Now, on the flip side, when I go into the legislature, it is supposedly opposite. I'm one of three black people in the Senate and one of what 16 and out of 132 African Americans. So the legislature is predominantly white, predominantly conservative, predominantly Republican, and predominantly older. Like, so I have strikes against me every time I walk into to pass any type of legislation. And any legislation that I have that specifically is directed to the black community, they won't pass it. If it has anything about helping uh, alleviate racism or helping black people specifically, they won't pass it, they won't let it get heard. And so what it comes to, I have to be more strategic about how I advocate for my community. So what I have to do is I have to take the issues that they care about and make it a legislation that appeals to all people, where it seems like all people get to take advantage of it, even though my particular community is suffering more than others. So I have to make sure that if order to pass legislation, I can pass legislation that both Democrats and Republicans get on board. So a lot of times it's not some of the more um, extreme things that many of my folks want to see in my community. They tend to be a more moderate, more um, uh, uh, conservative in how um, I'm able to implement very progressive ideas because I'm in such a conservative legislature. Um, and so it, it's and it's hard because, you know, I get to be this free person who talks about the issues that I know would alleviate my community from so many hardships we had. But in the legislature, it's like if you tout those same issues, you are essentially punished. Um, and so in the legislature, I have to be a lot more docile. I have to be a lot more meek. I have to lot be a lot more um, feminine. Um, and the way that I move, because unfortunately, like I'm in a body of men and um, 
And especially being a black woman, and we have always have this reputation of being an angry black woman. I have to be more strategic about how I move. And while it's difficult, I'm very good at it. You know, I've passed more bills than many of my Democratic colleagues. I've been in leadership, supported by both Democrats and Republicans, and support Republicans supported me being a Democrat that went to this democratic seat. So while it's hard, I feel like I was built for this. I was made for this role and I'm going to get it done regardless. Um, and I tend to make sure that I can champion issues that both my community wants to see, but also issues that I feel like the rest of the state can get on board with. And we've been successful, especially when it comes to maternal health and human trafficking and some of the uh, criminal justice laws I've had. I've been able to build really sustainable relationships with Republicans so that when I do come to them in their office, is behind the scenes say, hey, this bill is hurting my community, the African-American community, or this bill is going to, they're open, they're open to listening to me. They may not actually do anything. Sometimes they will though. Um, but, you know, being in the legislature is far more strategic than being running for office. Um, so I would say um, both of them are hard. I, I like the legislative process way better than I like campaigning. Um, but you know, each of them has its own difficulties and challenges. Yeah. Yeah. And and your district is lucky to have somebody like you advocating for them, because to your point, it really is sort of different muscles that you have to flex in sort of communicating uh, to the, the public versus really a persuasion campaign to build coalitions, to build relationships, to do the work of creating, uh, you know, the, the coalitions you need to ultimately get legislation passed. That's why folks elected you is to get things done for them. And so that strategy is, um, you know, I, I think they're, they're lucky to have you. And um, Rep Pilkington, I think this is something that that you do extremely well uh, as well as a member of the majority. And I know that you and your counterpart um, have worked really effectively on issues uh, in a bipartisan way, even though in theory, you know, you don't really have to work with, with anyone if you didn't want to. Um, and so, so tell us, uh, you know, I think when you were off camera, I read something from your, from your profile or from your bio, it says you don't consider yourself uh, a firebrand, but you do have, you know, strong conservative values. How does that play out in the, uh, the transition from engaging your district, right, to then uh, being somebody in the majority who's yeah. actively looking for ways to uh, govern with Democrats in the body. Yeah, well, and I'll, I'll throw one more thing on there that kind of complicates the whole issue is I'm also the House campaign chair, and I've been that since 2018. So uh, everybody knows that I'm also responsible for uh, kind of election coordination and uh, we just grew a super majority by four more seats to 84. So it's kind of hard when uh, they're seen as also I'm the guy who helps eliminate their colleagues uh, on the other side. But what I say is, and I tell people this all the time, is especially with my, my colleague, Jamie Scott, who is probably the most opposite you can find. Uh, you know, she's a young African-American woman. She's from an urban district. You know, from, I'm from a rural district. Uh, it's a safe D district. I'm a safe R district. Our constituents have very different things we need. But I always say the reason why we work so well together and that I think we've been able to do so much is because we have a very honest relationship with one another. And so our thing is, I'm not looking to change your views. You're not looking to change my views. And there's actually at the MAP conference this uh, in Denver, someone sits on, I really love it. I've been using it all over the state as I go, I'm not really interested in common ground. I'm more interested in common solutions. And so that's something I think me and Jamie have always worked on really well is maybe we're attacking an issue from two different angles, but the, but the commonality of like, you know, what is the policy that gets us to where we see improvement is, is an area where we want to go. So I've got a healthcare background. I'm really big on maternal health and uh, do a lot around that. You know, Jamie's really concerned with uh, criminal justice reform. And so, you know, we had a bill that worked together that kind of focused on that where I was coming from it from a healthcare angle she was coming at it from a criminal justice uh, angle. And so it was one of those things is we both got to the same place, just took different paths. And so I, I really love kind of that. And that's how we work together. But like I said, to me, it's really about the honesty um, about who you are and what you believe. Um, and I think that's why it makes things, it, it allows me to be kind of more of an, an honest broker when it comes to people as they know I have a genuine desire uh, for, for policy change to do things. You know, I tell people all the time is, you know, I'm a young I'm a young guy. I'm, I'm 
you know, I'm, I'm talented. I like to think, and I can go do other things and make more money and <laughs> do this and that. The reality I'm here and I'm not going to waste my time here if I'm not going to get anything accomplished and do something. So my desire to do that, uh, I think kind of allows me to kind of work across, across the line where people go, you know what, I want to get something done too. And so if you're a Democrat in the super minority here in Arkansas, you know, you see me as kind of an honest broker as someone who actually wants to come and talk and, you know, I'll hear you out. Let's, let's do it. And I think too, I mean, just, and like I say, I always, I have very conservative credentials. I'm always the top one or two when it comes to the ACU and all these other groups. But the reality is like, I really like in, in innovative solutions. And so what I'll say this too, is sometimes it's, you know, I kind of say, what is a problem that maybe is really important to liberals? Is there a conservative solution in a state like Arkansas can do and vice versa? Is there an issue that's maybe really important to conservatives? You know, is there an idea that maybe from, you know, the left to center or left is my actually might say, you know what, this is actually a way to handle that issue that y'all are even considering. And I really enjoy doing kind of those talks and having those conversations because it, it sometimes kind of breaks you out of your shell. And, you know, a lot of times we get into a lot of group think and we got to do it this way. We can never, ever do it the other opposite way. And, you know, it's kind of funny because you're like, well, listen, you know, in a blue state, New England, they solved this issue doing this. We have a very similar issue. What if that's how we do it? You know, and so anyways, that's just um, I always like kind of thinking outside the box. And 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 I think to being able to compartmentalize what you do, there's the campaign, then there's the legislative process, you know, um, and and I think when you when you act that way and compartmentalize, it makes it way easier. I mean, I go down into the Capitol and I'm not looking to put up yard signs and create mail pieces and this and that. You know, I, I leave all that back home um, because the reality is it has no use for you down in Little Rock, you know, um, or the Capitol, wherever you may be. <laughs> so um, I, I guess I hope I answered the question on that. Yeah, I, yeah. I know it's kind of rambly, but. Um, it's really just, I would say, ultimately about just having genuine, honest conversations and just saying, this is what I view, this is what I want to do. If we know the parameters, we can actually work in those parameters um, and just know you're not going to get me to move on this issue. But ultimately, we want to see improvement in our state. And that's the thing I tell people, too, is like whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you want the country to be better. You want your state to be better. There may be different routes, but ultimately, at the end of the day, we all want our people to be happy, healthy and, and fulfilled. And so... Uh, if you know that's the ultimate end goal, um, you can sometimes find your paths crossing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that word that you use for innovation and thinking about solutions as coming from anywhere on the spectrum so long as it can help move people forward, innovate on uh, on a problem. And um, as young people, it strikes me that you might be uh, more naturally oriented to being open to some of those kinds of, of solutions. Um, I want to bring... Elizabeth back in. Um, Elizabeth, join Thank us. You. Yes, yeah. hello. This is a great conversation. Um, I see that some questions are coming in through the Q&A, so I want to encourage everyone, if you do have a question, to feel free to submit one. Um, I'm going to ask a question or two, but then we're going to open it up to those the questions coming in from our audience. Um, Layla uh, referenced it uh, sort of early on that one of the values of these kinds of conversations is it gives our students or it gives young adults around the country um, some role models, uh, some examples of how you know people around their same age are running for office or serving in office. So it'd be really helpful, I think, if you could both of us share share with both of us or share with all of us. Um, maybe a little, give us a bird's eye view of what your day is like. Um, we know that in the research we've been doing and the interviews we've had with, with young elected leaders, one challenge they often mention is, you know, service uh, comes at a time when they're also building careers, where they're also maybe starting a family. Um, both of you have alluded to that um, in different ways. But it'd be helpful for us, for our audience, and I'll start with you, Senator Lamar, maybe give us a sense of what your average day is like or what your average week is like and how you navigate that balance between your public service and maybe building a career or personal life, whatever you can share with us or feel comfortable sharing with us. Yeah, I'll just keep it real candy. I don't have a person. Well, I try to keep a personal life, but there's not really a such thing. When you sign up for elected office, you are essentially giving up your personal life. It don't matter if you're married, single, career, like all of those things are going to take a back seat because when you decide to become an elected official, you're taking the oath that this seat and everything that comes with it takes a priority over everything else you have going on. And I decided to do that young because that would give me time to do everything else. Now, it's been hard 
because it's definitely hindered me from being able to get married or really start a family or be able to have the dream job that I want um, because a lot of well-paying jobs are not going to pay elected officials because um, we tend to be too controversial or you don't know what anybody's going to say on the news about us. Mm -hmm. That's going to impact their business. So they don't want the liability. Um, so many of us have the force to try to find work at places who, who, who tend to be a lot more polarizing or issue based or start our own businesses. So it's hard. So I get up every day, you know, um, I take them. I, unless I have something to do, I get up and I'm drink my coffee. I watch a little TV. I go walk in. I truly like start the day off creating me time. I don't care who in, emailing me the, I mean, the, the something needs to be burning. Um, before I start answering your questions, before I give myself time to get myself together. Um, but typically my day is talking to constituents, answering emails, um, doing some sort of working on some sort of project, community related, going to a news conference, going to speak at some event um, or going to have coffee and meeting with some sort of stakeholder. So while they claim the legislature is part time, it's nothing part time. There's no not a moment I can go to a Kroger grocery store or a Target or Walmart or anything. And ain't nobody screaming, Senator Lamar, I need something from you. I got something to tell you. I got something to tell you. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, oh, you know, I'm in here with some sweatpants on and some slides. <laughs> That's OK. We, I'm going to hear you out. Uh, and I don't have on the suit. It don't matter. So when, once you take this role. You are forever the senator. Um, it's even more interesting than I tell young people, don't lose yourself. I have caught a lot of controversy and I'm a strong person, so I can handle it around the way that I carry myself. I am 31 years old. I'm single. I'm nice looking. You know, I work out. And so I wear my tight dresses. I go to the clubs. I go to the bar. Like I hang out. I kick it. I party. I do all of those things. I drink. Uh, I'm a little bit smarter about how I do it. Like I'm not going to be out drunk or get drunk. And, you know, uh, if I'm not in a safe place where I don't have a designated driver or anything like that, but I'll turn up. I engage hip hop culture completely. Um, you'll hear me putting rap songs on because I listen to rap all the time. Um, you'll hear me, hear me try to bring celebrity aspect to the work that I do to make it more appealable to young people like yourself. I feel like one of the reasons why young people aren't engaged because our politicians seem so stiff or you got to have a husband and a family and some kids to be qualified. I'm none of that. I'm, 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 I'm none of that. They call me London, the style, you know, politics because of how I'm breaking these ideas of conservatism, these ideas of what they put women and young people in a box of how we uh, show up. You know, I've been wearing red hair lately just to symbolize the breaking of conservatism in our political system to show young people, you can be whoever you want to be, but if you have a vision, if you have a mission, if you care, then those things, you can be anything you want to be. And so I want to say my day is busy. I don't necessarily, I create a life within this life, but it's my whole life is politics. And it's nothing wrong with that, guys, but just don't lose yourself because that's the one thing I refuse to do is to lose myself. Okay, thank you. Um, so that the importance of authenticity, I think, and accessibility really comes through in your response. Uh, Representative Pilkington, how about you? If you can share a little bit with us, kind of give us a bird's eye view of how you balance, sure. if you're able to balance um, all of it <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, how yeah. You do it. Um, that's, that's, it's really interesting here to London, uh, our Senator Lamar, sorry. Um, because I'm almost the complete opposite. Uh, I'm 31. I'm married. I have two kids, uh, Aaron, Michael, and and Benedict. Uh, and you know, I when I first got elected at 25, uh, you know, I wasn't married and have kids. And in the process, my second session, I got married. My third session, I had a kid. Um, you know, the nice thing is I've got a very understanding wife who understands. You know what it goes with. I mean, literally, you know, we're in the delivery room, and she, uh, you know, told me you know, well, if these two bills come up, you're allowed to leave to go vote for those. <laughs> uh, you know, so she's, she's very understanding. Um, but it's, it is a lot, it's a balance, you know, um, you know, I try to be home every night if I can't be, you know, um, you know, cause I've got some early meeting the next day or this and that, you know, we just try to talk and, and do everything we can to make sure that the kids see me. Um, you know, I've got with my work, I've got about an hour and 15 minute commute every morning after mm. day. And so I spend a lot of time on the road, but I use that time to make calls and to do whatever I need to do. Uh, luckily with, you know, my profession is a lot of it's talking <laughs> kind of joke, a lot meeting and coordinating, but, um, but it's, you know, it's just trying to find that balance. So, you know, I get up early in the morning with my sons and 
I spend time with them before I leave. And then, um, and then of course I, I get home in time to put in the bed and, and do what I can to do. And then the weekends, um, you know, you do have to find that balance of things you just say no to. I mean, there's, you know, Hey, you know, you're going to come to the, you know, the Turkey shoot at the, you know, rural fire department. And it's like, you know what? I I've got, I haven't seen my kids the last few days cause I've been traveling. I'm, I'm going to be with them. So sorry. And you know, the nice thing is most people are pretty understanding about that. You know, I say, here's my, you know, if you got issues, let me know, call me. But, um, you know, I just make it a, my priority, uh, to do that. And then of course with work, it is really hard. Um, you know, I think since I've been this job, uh, as a state rep, I've had, uh, two separate jobs. Um, I, I left one when I got elected and got another one. And then, uh, so I get, guess three, um, but it is trying to find a job that understands it. There's a lot of balance to it. Um, you know, being in healthcare and overseeing clinics, um, you know, it's, um, the nice thing is, is there's, there's, there's not a lot of overlay. So uh, a lot of people don't even see me as, as being a state rep. They just saw me as being a, a VP um, uh, of operations, but, um, but it does bleed over. And, you know, I've always had conversations with my employers of just, you know, there's, it's Aaron Pilkington, the employee, Aaron Pilkington, the state rep, those are two separate things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, people ever have issue with me or a vote or something like that, that's just not a place. That's not a work conversation. That's an after hours conversation. And, and oftentimes too, with, uh, you know, my employees, I think at one time I had 95 employees underneath me. It just comes a point when I just say, you know, if someone does want to bring something up to me, I just say, hey, I'd love to talk to you about it, but not on work time because that's not what I'm paid for to do here. And so having that and establishing that uh, early on in my job kind of helps teach people, uh, you know, that, you know, don't think of Aaron as state rep Aaron Pilkington. He's this guy. So it's but it is a balancing act for sure. And, you know, you'll people say, hey, I saw you on TV last night. And you're like, oh, what for? Uh, you know, <laughs> so um, so uh, there's there's always that. But um it's really hard. I mean, as a young person, I'd say there's like, there's no book to read. Uh, I remember like when I first got elected, I was like, I really need to find stuff, someone to give me advice on this. And there was really no one to give me advice. So a lot of times I was just feeling my way through it. And it's interesting, you know, we had, I think around 20 or, or 19 uh, new uh, young Republicans elected to the legislature. And so a lot of times I'm actually talking to them, you know, after the election of, you know, where do I stay when I'm down the Capitol? You know, how do I, how do I deal with this in my job? You know, does your wife get mad when you're down here, you know, three nights in a row, you know, you know just all those things like that, that you're trying to answer and explain to about life. And it looks different for everybody, but there is some advice and even, even some simple things. It's like, you know, um, Senator Lamar kind of alludes to this, like how you dress, you know, you've got guys who are like, you know, what do I need to wear? Um, you know, I know talking to some female legislators too, they say that all the time. It's like they win. And, you know, a lot of time they, they, they're like, well, what do I wear every day to session? So, um, so there's, in, in many ways, I'd say as an older, you know, I'm entering my fourth term, I get to be a little bit of a mentor to some of these people on, hey, how, how do you do it? How do you balance everything? And it's hard and it looks different for everybody. Um, uh, but it's, um, I would say, you know, an average day, it's just, it's constant juggling. So like while Lily were on this, I've got two emails for work and he replied to, I had a, had a, uh, an attorney from the Bureau of List that researched telling me my ISP just got filed and had another rep say, hey, they're going to be there Wednesday at the public health meeting to run it because I'm going to be with MAP up in West Arkansas. So, um, you know, it's just all this stuff is happening right now while I'm doing this. It's just you've got to really learn just to balance everything. And and I would say sometimes you do just need a minute to um, kind of like Sarah Lamar said, you know, it's like take some me time and, uh, you know, be like, as long as nothing's burning down, I'm going to sit here and take an hour to myself or, or whatever. So that's really interesting. And I know it certainly speaks to the work that we do, but certainly the work that MAP does also, you know, it's, it's important not just to get young adults uh, voting and running for office and winning, but really building their capacity to govern mm-hmm. well um, and yeah. to be leaders. So we're going to transition now. We've got some questions that have come in. I know Layla and I could ask you a thousand questions. We have plenty <laughs> more we could ask. Um, but want to just make sure we've acknowledged that some folks have, have asked some questions and want to offer you all an opportunity to, to respond to them. Um, I think one that I might, I might bring up is, um, you know, certainly one issue that, um, young adults in particular are quite concerned about or will be facing, um, almost uniquely is the issue of climate change. So maybe putting, maybe put, uh, putting you both to task or letting us practice this bridging divides while we're all together. Um, you know, one question that has come in is it, uh, is about that topic in particular. 
um, that it's you know a complex issue that both uh, both of you will need to figure out or deal with now or into the future. Wondering how that you know taking that as an example, how young adults, how young legislators might collaborate on an issue such as this. Um, are there are there issues or are there areas where you can find common ground on a on a subject such as climate change? Uh, maybe uh, Senator Omar, I'll pass it off to you first. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm glad that you asked that question um, because um, to me, climate change is one of the most critical issues of our country and our world, just local, state, national, federal, global. It, our climate crisis is literally killing us. And I see a, directly, a direct impact on my community when I look at where they put in waste, our soil, our access to food, how hot it is, how cold now, I mean, I don't even think we have a fall anymore in Tennessee. It's just summer to winter. Um, and it is something that I care deeply about. Here's my problem. And I'm just going to talk from my perspective, what it's like to be a Democrat in a Republican state. I have tried to push uh, resolutions uh, to recognize World Water Day, um, climate change. And my colleagues have essentially told me the Republican House caucus chair said, we don't believe in climate change. So if your anything has climate change in it, we're not going to pass it. So for me, I said, okay, well, you know, in my opinion, y'all denying our reality, but whatever. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a little bit more strategic about how I am doing climate change. So instead of what I'm, so what I do is I look at, okay, all of the different issues concerning climate change right now and what and how they intersect with issues that I'm already working on when it comes to things I can get past. So maternal health is the one issue that I know. I got Republicans support because they love babies. Um, and what I do is I talk about issues regarding if we don't change these certain things in our community, which are climate change issues, then mothers are going to have trouble having their babies. Babies are going to have these different impacts on their bodies, blah, blah. So I always connected to how it's impacting babies and mamas. And therefore, I'm not saying climate change. I'm talking about children. But what I'm talking about are issues of climate change that are impacting our children to dress it up. So I'm more strategic about how I'm addressing these issues than saying, oh, climate change. Because if I say climate change, just like I say the black community or anything, I won't get the support that I need. So I've just kind of done it a different way. But what do young people need to be doing right now? What young people need to be doing is regardless of, well, if you live in a conservative state like mine, it's going to be a little bit harder. But if you do have the ability to live in a majority climate change supportive state, then you do have the ability to start making statewide changes. And as the pendulum swings back, because I believe Tennessee will become more purple one day, then I have examples of legislation for other young people in other states who have passed good things that I can use as, a, uh, as an example of legislation we need to pass in our state, even though we're going to be probably a decade or so behind. So you just have to be more strategic. And I do want to use that as a, to, to say to young people, Policy making is very slow moving, very slow moving. So a lot of times you think that we can just pass this bill and the solution is fixed. Absolutely not. That is not how it works. Anytime you're making policy for millions and millions and millions of people, it needs to stay slow moving so you can catch any mistakes or any unintended uh, consequences of any policies that you have. So no, we in Tennessee, I can't promise you that we're going to have a whole encompassing climate change agenda that's going to get passed. <laughs> Absolutely not. What I can tell you is if you yourself as young people at Rutgers see some issues I need to be focusing on on climate change, send them to me and I as the legislator can figure out how I can work these issues in to get to where we go, even if it's not on a straight and narrow path that you think it should be. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bill Keaton, how about you? An issue such as, as such as climate change, again, we know that through survey research, it's one of the top issues of concern for young adults. Um, is that a topic or that you, you could... Uh, find a way to, you know, sort of bridge divides between you and your, your fellow legislators and, and advance the issue for young adults and the rest of the country. Sure, sure. So um, actually a few years ago, I, uh, I was the house sponsor of our net metering bill here for solar energy, which uh, created the largest expansion of solar energy in Arkansas. 
Uh, I actually had a guy who was working for the chambers and said that probably was the biggest economic development bill for rural Arkansas uh, in the last, you know, last eight years. Uh, and, he, you know, just the amount of people who started using it. You had people who were literally, you know, building solar farms on rural, rural land they had that maybe they inherited from somebody because of the way we set it up, were able to get their, you know, basically not an electric bill in Little Rock, Arkansas, the capital. So it was, it was a great thing to do, great for expansion of that. But, you know, the way we did it was that we said, hey, this is free market right here. Um, you know, this is not uh, this is not some ooey gooey, uh, you know, pie in the sky kind of dream. This is, you know, hey, you like money. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, this is economically makes sense for you. Uh, going green is, is economically makes sense for you. And that's the things you see, you know, with a lot of companies like building things like that, switching to LED lights, all sorts of things. It's like, if it becomes energy efficient and it's also economically sound, then it's like we should push those policies as much as we can and also incentivize that as well. I mean, that's really incentivizing the market to go towards to go greener is, is kind of a Republican response. There's a great organization called, I think it's called the American Conservation Coalition or something. It's kind of a center right group, but you know, they're pro free markets and pro um, climate change, not pro climate change, but you know, <laughs> addressing climate change. And, you know, I think uh, having, you know, they're just really up front, you know, they like nuclear too, which I know is not everyone's in favor of that. But, you know, I have Arkansas Nuclear One is in my district. The only nuclear plant in Arkansas is here. So, you know, I love kind of telling that, you know, I've got the best, most efficient form of energy in my backyard. Um, of course, after watching Chernobyl, you know, you kind of second guess that, but it's all good. It's all safe. Um, but, you know, I think on is, is how do you bring people to look at it as a different angle? So, you know, a lot of times it's all about, you know, stop the evil oil company, stop doing this. It's like, listen, we have a lot of people here in Arkansas who work for those industries. They don't view them as evil. And when you say that they're evil, all you're doing is, you know, making them become defensive of it. And so when we uh, talked about, you know, our solar bill, you know, we made it geared towards nonprofits as well, could take advantage of this. So we had faith groups come out and say, hey, this will be great. I would love it if we could, you know, put solar panels on the top of our, our daycare that we have or things like that. Mm-hmm. And, and so we made it as, you know, and also, in, but, and to that point, we also, you know, there's an idea of taking care of God's creation and, and, and maintaining it. And of course, we have a lot of duck hunting, we do too. And so we talked about, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had a program that, you know, companies that could help us preserve these lands so that we could preserve the, our, you know, our, our water sports over here in duck hunting, uh, you know, if they were to pay in and, and, you know, offset their carbon footprint by helping us preserve these wetlands, would that be so that you'd be interested too. And, you know, funny thing is a lot of the executives go and duck hunt. <laughs> so, you know, to them, they're like, yeah, that sounds great to me. So a little bit about, you know, just people's own self-interest, you know, um, it's hard for a lot of people sometimes to get behind it because there is a lot of cynicism, especially on the right, but even among young people too, you know, I mean, if you go back and watch an inconvenient truth, you know, he makes all these 10 year predictions, which I now are like 15 years old. So, you know, not all of them came came. And so people say, well, see, that was wrong. So I don't believe any of this. And you go, well, that's, you know, that was a prediction that's wrong, you know, and you can't be high, you know, I think you just have to come and say, but don't you care about, you know, making sure that when you go out and you, you know, walk a trail that there's not trash all over the ground, which I know isn't necessarily climate change, but it's, it's environmental, you know, and then the same as, you know, aren't you, don't you like it? The fact that you can, um, you know, your air is clean and that it's fresh and that, you know, you don't have some, hog factory that's just uh you know polluting and making a terrible smell i mean aren't you worried about your property value so sometimes just talking to that self-interest i think and you know there's that's kind of a bad rap about millennials is we're very into ourselves and self-focused but the reality is, is that's a motivator if, you, if you're a rational consumer you're going to take care of yourself and then of course now as we're getting older and having kids there's also that discussion about like well what, what kind of world do you want to leave your children you know do you want them to be able to play in the same streams and rivers do you want them to be able to have a fall you know, and have a, have a white Christmas, things like that. Well, let's do these things that are actually going to make that worthwhile. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, so as there's a desire to, to do that, it's my view is I think it's such the way as millennials need to look at it, it's going to be a little more carrot and a little less stick, which I think has been the approach in the past. And then that way, you know, people choose not to, not to go for the carrot. You can say, well, you can stay where you're at, but if you want to be innovative and want to move forward, you're going to take advantage of these uh, incentives. And, and I think that's kind of a younger kind of I, out, out of the box idea because, you know, back in the seventies, it just was tax them, regulate them, put them out of business or make it harder for them to do what they're going to do. Where now it's, Hey, why don't we make it easier for them to do the things they should be doing to help address climate change? Okay. We're almost at the end. We've got about five more minutes, but I want to make sure we've let our, our, our viewers uh, 
have their questions addressed. Layla, I think you have one one last question for us. Okay, I'm going to call this the mega question because I think I'm going to try <laughs> to take a few of the questions that are in the Q and A box and and put them all together. Um, and and so you know we we talked a little bit at the beginning about how many young people turned out to vote. And yet that is only one day of the many hundreds of days that are part of, right, a legislative session. Election day is just one day. And then there's so many days of governing, of policymaking, of getting things done. Mm -hmm. And so the question to you both is, how do you keep your constituents engaged after election day? How do you center them in the policymaking process and keep them excited about the work that you're doing on their behalf, acknowledging that to your point, Senator Lamar, sometimes it's kind of slow, you know, a bill doesn't get passed into law uh, overnight. And how do you make sure that they don't get distracted or discouraged by some of the things um, that we read online, that we read in the media, that often do really divide us and polarize us when you're doing a lot of good work strategically to bring people together inside the legislature. What does that look like for both of you? And and I know you've both been so, so successful at doing it. Tell us your secret. What are you doing? How are you getting these things done? And how are you keeping your constituents involved? And sadly, we'll have to ask you to be brief. (laughs) Yes, I'll be very, very brief. So one thing that I feel like I've been very innovative, I was really one of the first legislators that really took on social media in a real way. So during the session, you will see me post every week a legislative update that I record in the studio and I put on my social media. I share things to my story. I talk about things on my Instagram, my Facebook. Uh, I'm still getting used to TikTok. I don't like videos a lot, but I do them. Um, And I work on my brand 100%. I literally spend money on my brand from the photo shoots to the everything that's going to get people to click. And and then I put the information in a caption because that's how us millennials, we work. I also send out weekly emails. And I also, most importantly, I engage in free earned media by every time the news asks me to speak up on some time or talk about things. I am going to interview and people vote. When people went to the polls, they said to me, um, oh, you're the girl I see on the news all the time. I see you on the news talking. I appreciate you speaking out. I appreciate you standing up. Thank you. Thank you. So I use media and my social media to keep people engaged. And to answer your last question, which was to it was one more. You you know, people get discouraged and polarized. How do you keep them thinking? positive? I pick and choose what I want to respond to. I'm in control. And I decide what's valuable to speak on and I'll decide what's not because the moment I speak on it, it, it continues to blow a fire. So I'm very strategic about what I speak out and I don't speak out on anything I don't believe in or people I don't like or don't care for. There we go. That's leadership. All right. The final word to you, Rep Pilking- Pilkington. Uh, to keep it brief, just social media. I've got a column in the newspaper that that it runs every week. Uh, it's kind of more of an older demographic, but for the young people, it's all it's all social media and to, and to keep getting discouraged. It's yeah. I think it's just, uh, you know, I like to highlight the good things that happen because a lot of times the media likes to focus in on the, all the negative things. And it's good to say, Hey, guess what? We did this this week or we did this. And, you know, cause they don't want to report on the bills that passed 99 to zero. You know, they, they want to talk about the one that passed 51 to 49, but yet that 99 to one bill was just a really good thing that we all decided we needed to do. So I try to highlight those things to be like, Hey, it's not all doom and gloom. Look, this great thing that we did. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, Elizabeth, I'll hand it over to you to close us out, but thank you to our our map network, to everyone who joined and uh, to just the two of you for being such great role models. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, our time is up. And I really want to join Layla in thanking, thanking Layla, first of all, for joining us. And thank you uh, to our young elected leaders for joining us. Um, Certainly want to thank again, our supporters of the Louis J. Gambaccini Civic Engagement Series. Um, You know, here at Eagleton, part of our mission is to improve democracy and inspire engagement. And certainly our guests have inspired me and I hope that they've inspired all of you. So thank you all for joining us and have a nice day.